Chapter 6, The Boy on the Wooden Box I heard a shot and then another. I felt a bullet whiz past my ear. It pierced the wall behind me. I quickly ducked into the alcove entrance of the nearest building, my heart racing. More shots rang out. Had I been hit? How would I know? I had once been told I might not feel it if I were shot. I only knew I was terrified. I banged on the door I was standing in front of and waited. What was going to happen next? Was the soldier reloading? Did he now have me in his sights? The door creaked open an inch. I pressed hard and pushed myself inside, begging. Prose, prose, please, please. What are you doing here, out here? The man asked roughly as he shut the door behind me. I tried to answer, but I couldn't get the words out. I stared at my shaking hands. There was no blood at that, on them. I felt my chest, my legs, my head. I was alive. I had not been hit after all. Tears rolled down my cheeks. I was trying to help, I finally answered. Earlier that evening, my friend Yassel and I had carried an el elderly woman on a stretcher to the ghetto infirmary, but we had made a dangerous miscalculation. We had waited too long at the infirmary with her before heading home and had stayed out past the evening curfew, the hour when all Jews had to be off the streets. To reach our apartment building, we had to round a corner by one of the ghetto gates where several guards always stood at on sentry duty. We ran as quickly as we could toward that corner. As we ran as quickly as we could toward that corner, one of the guards lowered his, his rifles and aimed at us. Driven by instinct and fright, Yassel and I ran, splitting off in different directions, barely escaping the shots. The guard probably lost interest in us as soon as we disappeared from his view, but I wasn't ready to take another chance with my life. I spent the night with strangers, curled up on the cold floor, terrified and very much alone, glad I had not been shot. When I finally made it home early the next morning, my mother flung her arms around me. Most of the time, my mother kept her emotions under control, but in that moment, she sobbed hysterically. The thought of losing another son was just too much for her. The transport had emptied the ghettos of many of its inhabitants, including not only the Luftigs and my brother Selig, but also Samuel and Yassel's father, Mr. Burks, who had shared his family's food with me. As a result, space was no longer an issue, but other dangers escalated. Hunger overwhelmed us all. Disease spread unchecked, weakening, crippling, and even killing indiscriminately. There was an overpowering sense of futility. Bribes had not protected even the wealthier people in the ghetto. Everyone had lost someone they loved. By this time, survival was mostly a matter of pure luck. What worked in one's favor one day might not the next day or even the next hour or second. Some people still thought they were smart enough to outmaneuver the Nazis, that they could navigate through the ma maze and survive the war. Actually, there was no sure way to make it through the world that had, had gone completely insane. In late October 1942, news of another transport reached Schindler, so he kept his Jewish workers at the factory overnight instead of sending them back to the ghetto. He knew the fragile work permit was no guarantee of safety during the roundups. Peza also spent her night at the, the night at her factory, which meant my mother and I were alone in our apartment. My mother and Mrs. Burks had devised a strategy they hoped would protect us. They decided to hide in plain sight, sweeping and cleaning the courtyard, looking busy and useful. Meanwhile, Mrs. Burks' sons, Yassel and Samuel, and I would hide in the crawl space of a storage shed behind our building. It was a tight space since there were only ten inches, about ten inches, between the rafters and the roof. In the morning, the ghetto reverberated with sounds of the action, the roundup, gunshots, shouts in German, doors banging, and heavy boots on the stairs. My mother and Mrs. Burke put their plan into action. They quickly began sweeping the courtyard as if their lives depended on it, which, in fact, they did. Yassel, Samuel, and I crawled into our hiding place. With scarcely room to breathe, my friends and I tried to stay motionless and silent as we waited. Lying on a rafter, I could only see the floor of the shed below. All I could do was listen as screams and shots filled the air. The noise grew steadily louder as the soldiers neared the building. The German shepherds used to ferret out people in hiding were barking ferociously. Their handlers ignored pleas for mercy and killed them indiscriminately. I covered my ears, trying to block out the shrieks and moans and cries of please and no. Suddenly my sh mother appeared in the shed. She had intended to bring us a teapot with water and then turn return to the courtyard. But the Nazis approached. Some sort of survival instinct clicked in. She set down the teapot and cried it crawled into the crawl space, climbed into the crawl space with us. 
Tightly packed together, we prayed we would not be discovered. Then a horrifying realization entered our heads. We all stared down at the floor. In her rush to hide, my mother had left the teapot right below us. If the Nazis entered the shed, spotted, us, spotted it, and became suspicious, they would surely look up and discover our hiding place. We lay motionless for a long, long time. I closed my eyes, imagining bullets penetrating the rafters and tearing holes in me. We were such easy targets. After several hours, the screams stopped. Occasional shots rang out, but they, became, they came at longer and longer intervals. We seemed to have escaped the worst for now, but we didn't dare move. When it grew dark, we heard a man's voice in the courtyard saying, It's safe now. You can come out. My eyes met my mother's. She whispered an, a barely inaudible no. I understood immediately. It could be a trap. We would stay put. That night, a numbing chill descended on the ghetto. Yasel, Samuel, my mother, and I clung to each other in the darkness, teeth chattering. We lay awake, too frightened to sleep or give in to our need for the bathroom. The following day, the SS, an organization that began as Hitler's personal bodyguard and grew to have vast authority over the Jewish question, continued to patrol the ghetto. We could hear the random shots, the dogs, the screams. My mother's instinct had been correct. The action was not over. I wasn't sure I cared any more. I was at my end. Hunger, thirst, and fear had thoroughly depleted me. All I could do was think of that teapot of water my mother had left on the floor below. I tried to convince myself to convince her that I could jump down, grab it, and bring it back without being noticed, but she would have none of it. Shivering from cold and fear, the four of us remained in our cramped refuge until dusk. The hours seemed interminable. Finally, another voice in the we heard another voice in the courtyard. Chana Laysen, a man called out. I was sent by Moshi Laysen. Startled, we stirred from our half-conscious state. I searched my mother's eyes. She was unsure what to do. Is Chana Laysen here? he asked again. I work at the factory with your husband, Moshi. Reassured by twice hearing my father's name, my mother nodded to me. And finally, after almost two full days, we dropped down from the rafters. Pain shot through my leg as I landed on the floor. I grabbed the teapot and swallowed a few gulps of water before passing it on to Yassel and Samuel. Stiff and sore, the four of us emerged from our sanctuary exhausted, thankful to be still be alive. Her voice hoarse and weak, my mother called out to the man. Here, she cried, I am Chana Layson. She and the man spoke together quietly as my friends and I nervously surveyed the deserted courtyard. Were we really safe? Were we really were we the only ones still alive? Without a word, Yasel and Samuel dashed inside their, our building to search for their mother. Their apartment was empty. Their mother was nowhere to be found. She had been seized in the roundup. Yasel and Samuel would have to rely on their own resources. They were not the only youngsters left to fend for, them, for themselves in the ghetto. Of course, adults helped them in many ways, but basically the boys knew that drawing as little attention to themselves as possible was their best chance for survival. In the late evening, my f father, David, and Peza returned to our apartment with scraps of bread in their pockets. I tore into the food even before I hugged them, but forced myself to stop so that we could all share the meager morsels. My father delivered the latest news. He, David, and Peza had been ordered to report immediately to the Plazal, Plazcal labor camp about two and a half miles from the ghetto. For the first time, our family had been forced into the ghetto some eighteen months before the five of us still together would be separate were to be separated as the population of the ghetto continued to diminish officials began to reorganize those of us remaining in december my mother and i were transferred from ghetto b the section where we had been living to ghetto a the area now designated for workers a barbed wire fence went up dividing the two sections of the ghetto then the relocation began we were ordered to take only what we could carry and to find a living space for ourselves in ghetto a without a moment's hesitation i grabbed the precious parting gift mr Lubtick had given me his thermos i also carried a jacket and a blanket it broke my heart to believe leave behind mr Lubtick's treasured pipes before we left our apartment my mother helped had me help her drag out the pieces of furniture we hadn't used as full to the balcony and push them over the railing the cabinet table and chairs splintered to pieces as they can crash to, into the concrete courtyard. My mother had decided if she, wa she wasn't going to leave anything valuable or useful to the enemy, if she could help it. 
Once again, I was impressed by my mother's cleverness and courage. It felt good to do something against the Germans, even if it was if the only thing we could do was destroy our own possessions. My mother waited until the very last minute to cross over to Ghetto A, rushing back to our building one last time for a cooking pot, which she wrapped in a sheet. I could hardly believe she would take such a risk for a mere pot, but going back gave her one more minute to survey her kitchen and what had been our home. Initially, we, had no, we found no place to stay in Ghetto A. Door after door closed in advance of our arrival. Every apartment was filled to capacity. Eventually, we found two spots in an attic. We squeezed into a space and with other relocated workers from Ghetto B, sleeping in, floor, in rows on the floor. My mother and I shared a single blanket. Our situation now made our room with the love tigs seem like a mansion by comparison. Somehow, in these horrible circumstances, my mother and I found the will to persevere. We had to keep going for each other. Each morning, my mother went to her cleaning job and I went to a factory. When we said goodbye, I wondered if it might be for the last time. Every time I returned from work and found her there waiting, I felt there was still hope. Every night we prayed for my father, David, and Peza were safe, that Herschel and our extended family were still secure in Nareka, and that Salig had somehow escaped and found a safe hiding place. Then, in, 1940, in March 1943, the Nazis liquidated the entire ghetto. All of us remaining were to be sent to Plasgau. At least that was the rumor. Honestly, honestly, I was glad to be leaving, thinking that once again the five of us would be together. I had no concept of what Plaskow was. I felt a naive confidence that because I had a real job, I was protected. On the day we were transferred, the Germans ordered us to line up in groups according to our work assignments. My mother stood with the cleaning women. I stood with the, my group from the brush factory. I saw my mother pass through the gates without incident. When my turn came, a guard yanked me out of line. He clearly thought I was too young and puny to be useful. You'll go later, he said, pointing me to a group of other children gathered to the side uh, out of the formations. My work permit was useless. I found my friends Yasul and Samuel already there. In the chaos of our move to Ghetto A, I had lost track of them. They had managed to survive on their own without their parents, but now we were all caught in limbo. They whispered to me, we're going to hide like we did before. You should come with us. I thought about going with them and returning to our narrow hiding place in the rafters of the shed, but something stopped me. I'm not sure why I felt the pull so strongly, but I knew it had to be with my mother. I knew I had to be with my mother. She and I had been through so much together. She was my strength and I was hers. So I told Yasel and Samuel, I'm going to try something else. I spotted another group of workers and attempted to blend into their ranks. Once again, we inched towards this gate of the ghetto, and once again, as I came close, the same guard spotted me and pulled me out, shoving me away from the departing group. Although I knew it was risky, I loitered as close to the gates as possible, waiting for a moment when I might be able to dart through them. At long last, the guard was called away. I saw my chance to join another group. There was a lump in my, with a lump in my throat, I had moved forward closer and closer to the exit, desperately hoping the guard would not reappear. As I reached the gate, two officers waved me through, and I was now headed among those headed to Plazau. My heart was racing. All I wanted was to see my family again, no matter what the situation. As I walked out of the ghetto with its tombstone crowned walls and along the streets of Krakow, I was dumbfounded to see that life seemed to be just as it had been before I entered the ghetto. It was as if I were in a time warp, or as if the ghetto were on another planet. I stared at the clean, well-dressed people busily moving from place to place. They seemed so normal, so happy. Had they not known what, that we had been suffering just a few blocks away? How could they have not known? How could they have not done something to help us? A street streetcar stopped. The passengers boarded, oblivious to our presence. They showed absolutely no interest in who we were, where we were going, or why. That our misery, confinement, and pain were irrelevant to their lives was simply incomprehensible. As we neared the Plaskow camp a short while later, I was still overjoyed that I had succeeded in leaving the ghetto. All that mattered to me was that I would now be with my family again. As I entered, entered the chaos of Lazau, I saw before me a world far worse than I had, could have ever imagined, far worse than I ever thought possible. 
Stepping through those gates was like arriving at the innermost circle of hell. 